2020 U.S. Census, over 20 million children are in fatherless homes. And while experts may disagree on the details, none can deny that nu the numerous problems it causes those children in particular, and society in general. It cannot be denied that children deprived of a father are robbed of important physical, emotional, intellectual, and economic benefits throughout their lifetime. Boys and girls grow up poor and deprived of essential love and support. Boys don't learn to behave like men. Girls don't learn how to be treated like women. Both are more likely to perpetuate poor behavior and pass it down to succeeding generations. They're also far more, far more likely to drop out of school, go to jail, be sexually active, have children outside marriage, and remain poor. Now there are, of course, exceptions to those uh, uh, who are affected by parent, uh, fatherless homes, but the facts are just undeniable of the impact that it has on these children. Well, tonight, our Faith's Hall of Shame lesson is about Esau, the godless one, who, despite having a well-known father, is a testimony to the dangers of an indulgent father, a kind of a dysfunctional home, if you will. And if you wonder why I believe that is the case, I want you to notice how the Faith's Hall of Fame refers to Isaac and as the father of Jacob and Esau. But then in chapter 12, talks about Esau as a godless son or godless one in, in the, in the uh, context of fatherly discipline. Keep your marker there in Genesis, but turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 11, and then we're going to look at the, uh, chapter 12 as well. Hebrews chapter 11, there in verse 20, we read this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20 says, By faith... Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding things to come. So Isaac was blessed with Jacob and Esau. He blessed them both with regard to things to come. But it doesn't say anything about him by being faith. In verse 21 it says, by faith, Jacob. So it goes on to Jacob being faithful. Then in chapter 12 you have some discussion about Esau that really indicate that there is a problem with his childhood and with his development because of a lack of discipline in his home. Beginning in chapter four, uh, chapter 12, and in verse 4, we read this. We see that there is the, the we see this in verse 4. It says, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? That's instructor or uh, help grow to maturity. But if you are without that instruction and discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of Spirits and live? For they, these earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time, as seemed the best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And then in verses 12 through 15, he talks about, or in verse 14, he talks about some things kind of coming flowing out of that. But I want you to notice what he then says in verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, or profane as some other versions say, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, so he sought it with tears. So in this text, after talking about Father God disciplining his children, like fathers who discipline their children, then he jumps a couple of passages and then talks about Esau being a profane or a godless man who 
didn't appreciate what God had given him, or what he had been blessed with, and what he had an opportunity to have, and describes him as immoral and godless. What we see, I think, in this context, and I think what the writer is trying to tell us, is this is the impact of an indulgent father and favoritism in families. These are the kind of things when you have parents playing favorites. They have one children that favors another one. I have a very, very good friend, I love him very dearly, who uh, has struggled with emotional problems going back to the fact that when he was young, he had three sisters, and his mother made it very clear that he was the baby, and made it very clear that she didn't want him. As far as she was concerned, she had three girls, and that were all that mattered to him. He was his daddy, and he could do whatever he wanted with his dad, but he was not important to her. And so that messed him up. And so we see the, the fact of how favoritism and indulgence, we see it anecdotally in people's lives, and I think when you see studies that address it, there are problems that are associated with it. There are problems that come from father, or fathers who are indulgent or parents who are indulgent. And I think that's what we see here in Esau. And so... I wanted to talk about that a little bit from the standpoint of seeing how it impacts and affects lives. And then how we, at the end, can look at some ways to change that in our own lives and make sure that we are not like that, either like Esau or the indulgent parent, either one. Now, as we unpack this message, we're going to have to look at a couple things, the three things, the background, get a little background study of who Esau is and, and how his life developed. Then we'll see the, the baseline of behavior that came out of that, and then the blowback, because there was some blowback. There were some results from that that were negative for them as adults, and then we're going to be looking at that tonight. Let's look first of all at the background. Well, the background, now let's go back in Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to look at the background. And what we see in Genesis 24 actually is the marriage of Isaac to Rebekah. And this marriage relationship that takes place is an arranged marriage between what I call a privileged son and, and, and a greedy girl. Now, it, it, kind of making some assumptions about her, but it seems like there was uh, possibly there a desire in her part, not just to get out, not necessarily to get out and go on her own, but when she saw all the things that this man had and that this uh, the Abraham's servant brought, there was a desire to go after that and pursue that instead of uh, wanting to do something that would just be good. The, there are some good things about Rebecca, and I'm not going to talk about uh, and completely uh, say that she was not a good person, but there were some things that indicate some problems with her character. Now, we see the courting of this. In chapter 24, we have the story of, I, of Abraham's servant going on behalf of Abraham to find a bride for Isaac from his family. Uh, from his family there in uh, back in Haran. And so when, when we first meet him, we see him and uh, bringing his camels, and he asks her to get water, and she brings the water, and this was something that he had asked God to show him. And so he saw in her some good, and he wanted to see if she would consider being a bride. And so she goes to the family. And these would be Abraham's relatives in verse 53. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the, spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. And this is after they had already agreed that she could go and marry uh, Isaac. And so he's ready to go. Verse 55, but her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10, afterwards she may go. Now, we may have a later lesson on Laban and get an idea of, of him. But this implicit, I think, in this statement is he's wanting them to stay so he can get more stuff from him. He's trying to, to pull more goods out of them. So the longer they stay, the more he can get out of this man. Because we see him later on dealing with Isaac as a very greedy, self-centered man. But in verse 55 and verse 56, he said to them, this is a ram servant, Do not delay me, since the Lord has crossed from my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the girl to consult her wishes. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And so she decides that she's going to go. She wants to go. She's ready to go. Uh, whether she's totally dominated by the desire for the goods as well or to get out from underneath her brother, the text just doesn't say but as we see in her behavior later, it seems like there's some, some self-interest in this as well. 
And when she gets there and she first meets Isaac, they get off to a good start. Let's continue there in, in, in uh, verse 62 there in Genesis 24. Now Isaac had come from going to Bir Laharoi, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus, Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And so they form a relationship, a loving relationship. There was a good relationship, at least at the start. Now, we don't know. Again, the text is very sparse in the information. But apparently, over time, things might have become a little strained because they went a long time without any children. 20 years, as a matter of fact, because he was 40 when he married her. We never, we're never told how old she is. He was 40. And he was then 60 when their children were born. So there was a long period before she became pregnant. And then not only that, it was a difficult conception and birth. Look at Genesis chapter 25. In verse 20, we're told how old he is. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Paid and Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And then in um, verse 26, when the children were born, after his brother came forward, forth uh, with his hand holding on Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So there was a 20-year gap there when they were trying to have children and were not successful. And Isaac prayed to God and sought God's help, and she became pregnant, and they had a child. But even there, there's, there's no record of any actual strife, but you can imagine there might have been some strife, uh, some. But as we see over time, though, after the birth of the children, we saw, see almost immediately a record of different interests. They become focused on different things. And that's where we're going to get to the baseline. The baseline is the character of the two boys. Right, so let's establish the baseline. We've kind of got the background. Now let's look at the baseline of what these two boys are like, Jacob and Esau. Of course, our focus is on uh, Jake, uh, Esau. The first thing that we see is we learn a little bit about their character in the prophecy about their birth. She was already pregnant. And let's begin in verse 21. And let's read down through verse 23. Or actually down through verse 26. Verse 21 says, Isaac prayed to the Lord. This is in Genesis 25. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled within her. And she said, it is, if it, it struggled within her, and she said, if it is so, why then I, am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two people will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the young, uh, older will serve the younger. So she's told that there's going to be conflict between these boys, already starting in the womb. So there's kind of a baseline of conflict between Jacob and Esau. And this is a problem that's going to be unfold, not just then, but as, uh, as they grow. And so in verse 24, there's a little bit more information provided for us as well. And this is the, uh, the strife before birth. And then when they, they're born, their family favoritism we see showing up. Now when the first, uh, verse 25. Now uh, when her days were, uh, verse 24, when her days were to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterwards, the brother came forth with his hand, holding on Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. And then here's where we see the different interests beginning to show. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. And Rebekah loved Jacob. Doesn't tell us why, but they had two, they both picked their favorites. The oldest boy was Jacob's, uh, Isaac's favorite, and the youngest, Jacob, was uh, Rebekah's favorite. Now, as we see this, we see Esau becomes the favorite of his father. 
as the oldest son, he's presumed to be the heir and most likely indulged by his doting old father, an older father. And so we think about it, dad's 60 years old, and so as he's beginning to grow, as a 63-year-old, if my wife had a child right now, uh, that would be a miracle. Uh, it would be a miracle, I'm telling you. Uh, but anyway, if that were to happen, I probably would be a doting old father. You know, just indulging the child just because... I don't know if I'd have the energy to say, no, no, I mean, I've got grandkids in the house every day, and I don't have the energy to say, no, well, I'd be able to do it. But anyway, it, it would get tiresome, and, it, and there are things you're allowed to do that are, are not, uh, you know, that, that we would not have allowed our kids to do. And so you struggle with these things. And as a result, he took everything for granted. I think that's where we see his character develop. He takes everything for granted. He's allowed to do anything he wanted. He has everything. He's the oldest. He's the heir. Presume we don't know if uh, Sarah, uh, Rebecca, had told uh, uh, Isaac or uh, Isaac about the prophecy from God. We don't know how she found, got that, or how it was received, and how it was distributed among the family. Whether it was talked about on a regular basis or something she hid within herself. And in the way she constructs going about getting the blessing, it seems like she didn't. She may not have told anybody. But he, so he thinks he's got it. He's on top of the world. He he's going to be the man of the house. He's going to be the heir of the of the, the the wealth of all that Isaac had, and all of that was going to be his someday. And so, as a result, as is typical when you have material indulgence. The children do not appreciate anything. In fact, there's a phenomenon I've been studying recently about how when you give people stuff, you just give them stuff for free and don't expect anything from them and, and don't require anything of them. After a while, they become expecting. They expect it. And they become dismissive and uh, resentful of the fact that you have stuff to give to them and that you haven't given them more. It's kind of a strange phenomenon that shows up. And so this shows up in, in the, the way children are raised. And so it says here that he despised. Go back to the text. All right, let's go to the text now and just read what happens with the, uh, with the birthright. This is in verse 29. Beginning in verse 29. And this shows where he, he was not appreciative of what God had given him and what he had been blessed with. Verse 29, chapter 25. When Jacob had cooked stew... Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. All right. I, uh, not the most articulate guy, I don't think, either. You're like, huh, give me some of that. I don't want that. It, it just, it, it, it's not the expression of a very thoughtful man. And he says, I'm hungry. I want it. Give it to me. Therefore, his name is called Edom. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. So Jacob is already a conniver, and that's a different story and a different lesson. And Esau said, behold, I am about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? Over dramatic a little bit? A little bit self-indulgent? A little bit uh, unconcerned about trying to maintain some decency and some self-control? No. I'm dying here. Give me that. I, you, you want it? You have it. I, if, I, if I'm dead, it's not going to be any good to me. If you love talk about letting his desire overcome his intellect and, and his will and his thought. And then verse 20, 33. And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and little stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. And that sentence is very specifically written and, because it tells us something about Esau's character. I'm dying. I won't need my birthright. Give me that food. So he eats it, gets a drink, gets up and goes. He's done. He, he has no concern about the consequences of his decision. He's got what he wanted, and he goes on his way. That is a profane person. That is a person who does not recognize the value or, or, or they understand fully the worth of things that he has. And notice the last phrase in that verse, at the end of verse 20, chapter 25. Thus Esau despised 
his birthright. He considered it of no value. It meant nothing to him. And so this is one of the consequences of overindulgent parents who give their kids everything they want, and so then they don't learn to appreciate anything. He looked down on it as of no value or importance. This is the birthright. This gives him a double portion of everything. As, so what would happen was if there were the two boys, the family goods, when Isaac died, would be divided into thirds, and he would get two thirds, and Jacob would have gotten one third. And considering how wealthy Jacob was, I mean Isaac was, that would have been a huge benefit to him, and he didn't count it of any value whatsoever. And it's very similar to the word profane that we read from Hebrews chapter 12. The word in Hebrews 12 talks about the idea of the basis of things, the basis of behavior. It comes from a word that means the threshold. Now, when you walk in the door this afternoon, how many of you, raise your hand, if you look down at the door, say, ooh, that's a lovely threshold. I wish I had one just like that in my house. Anybody? Anybody even think of it? No. It's what, in fact, you might kind of kick your feet on it a little bit and shake off the mud or anything and step in the water. It's the lowest of the low. And so what he's saying there in that text is that the, as far as uh, Esau was concerned, his character was the lowest of the low. It was like something he would walk on. That's how by and, uh, worthless he was in his character. That's the kind of man he was. He didn't think about it when he was sitting there thinking he was going to starve to death, and then he didn't think about it after it was sold. What he was thinking was, I have, I have more hunting to go do. Modern days would be, I have, you know, I have more hunting to go do, or I have more fishing to go do, or I have more golfing to go do, or I have more games to go play. I have more things that I want to go do. I have more books to read. Okay, that's me. I got, you know, whatever it might be that our self-indulgence might be. That's all he cared about. What God had offered him, not only would there be the, the double portion of all the goods, it also makes him the family representative and the, the one who would have the relationship with God, acting as sort of the priest for the family. And he didn't care about that at all. And he did nothing to him at all. And so as a result, he lost that. Now let's go to the blowback. Here's, here's how, how did that blow back up in his face? Well, the blowback was this. When it came time for the blessing, and this seemed like, you know, there's kind of debate there as to whether or not the blessing is separate from the inheritance and the, uh, the birthright. It, it seems, some seem to think that what, uh, what uh, Isaac is trying, or Esau is trying to do is kind of a backdoor to get the, the birthright anyway, even though he had sold it to his brother, swore to give it to his brother, by getting the blessing. And by now, it's all of a sudden it's very important to him to get that blessing, to get that, that recognition from his father. And so he goes to great lengths to do that. He goes out and he's asked for to go hunting and goes out to get this, this food for his father. And then after his father eats the food, he's going to be blessed by that. And you know the story, what happened was, Rebecca knew what was going on, and so she had Isaac, uh, excuse me, she had uh, Jacob pretend to be Esau. He had to put on sheepskin on his arm so, and, and on his neck so that when his blind father reached out and touched him, it would feel like, uh, feel like Esau. Now, what does that tell you, the difference in the kind of men? They, they were not identical twins, I would say, by any stretch. But anyway, so we know that. And so when he comes back in, so Isaac, or Esau comes back in, prepares the meat, goes in to his father, and the father's already given the blessing. And Esau is left out. He is left out, and it breaks his heart. Look in uh, chapter 27. Go to chapter 27. And I go down to verses 30 through 38. Now it came about this Genesis 27. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from, his pre from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And then he also made savory food and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that he you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. 
Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was he then that cut a game and brought it to me so that I ate of all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. Now notice Esau's reaction. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, for he supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? And so Isaac was able to give him a blessing, but it was certainly not as good as the one that would have been given, that it was given to Jacob. And here's the ultimate uh, blow back, verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So there's always blowback when there's dysfunction in the home and parents don't do what they should do. Now, of course, we know the story uh, that Rebecca heard that as well, and she sent uh, Isaac, uh, sent uh, Jacob off to her brother's house back in Haran. So you have this too little, too late. I, I want you to turn back to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, let's read that another verse back there in Hebrews chapter 12 to get an idea of exactly what, it, what was going on with Esau's mind and the mind trying to get this blessing. He wanted it. Verse 17. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. For you know that even after when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance. And the idea there is of a change of mind. This was it couldn't be changed. It was too little too late. The, the effect had already been, uh, had taken place. And there was nothing he could do to, to turn it back. Though he sought it with tears. That's the impact of parents who indulge their children and don't train them up to be the kind of people they should be. And this led the hateful heart and Jacob's exile. So, so there you got the story of Jacob and Esau, and the story of Esau, the indulged son. Well, kind of negative, kind of sad, kind of frustrating. But when you look at the fact that there are 20 million people and the uh, kids in this uh, country alone that are living in parents with that home with that father, and the impact it's having on them. I was talking to a guy yesterday, just an interesting conversation that developed out of nowhere. Um, and uh, it was at my grandson's birthday party, and this guy's son was uh, there for the party. And I got to talking to him, and, and found out that the boy is not his son. They're trying to adopt the boy. And they've been, the boy is seven years old. They've been trying to adopt the boy since he was 18 months old. And have been dealing with issues back and forth and still have not finished the process. And we were talking about the impact it's had on the kid. He's been back with his mom a few times and it just never had been good. Always difficult, always problematic. And are still wrestling with that issue. And this is repeated over and over and over again in the lives of children. And it just shouldn't be that way. And so that's why I want to take a little bit of time tonight to talk about Esau and the problem it has with children. And, and what we can do, we're not going to go fix the legal system. That was one of the things we talked about. We're not going to go fix that. But what we can do as parents, we've got a lot of young parents here, is we can make sure that we do deal with some of, some of these takeaways. And here's how we do this. Takeaway number one is appreciate God's will for marriage. One of the issues with uh, you know, with Esau was that he didn't have respect for women or for marriage. Probably didn't have any respect for his mother. And certainly uh, had no respect for, his, uh, uh, for marriage, God's law about marriage, because he went and married two or three people from other, uh, from other <coughs> nations instead of trying to marry someone that was uh, a godly person. He went married for other reasons. Look at, uh, go back to, uh, to uh, Genesis chapter 26. And notice in verses 34 and 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judah, the daughter of Beri the Hittite. So he married pagan women. Based on that, the daughter of Eli and the Hittite, so he married two women. And they brought grief to Isaac, to Isaac and Rebekah. So he went off and married whoever he wanted. He got two wives instead of just one. 
We saw from our lesson about Laban that that was not what God had intended. Now, so here's, our, here's my point here for you as a takeaway. Especially for you young parents. I appreciate God's will for marriage, not just in the fact that it's one man, one woman. That, that's, a no, that's a non-negotiable issue there. But secondly, that you raise your children the way God would have you to raise them. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 and to uh, Colossians chapter 4 as well, where it talks about, or 3, where it talks about how fathers are to raise their children. It's interesting that it talks about fathers raising their children. Fathers set a standard in the house that is, is essential for children and for young men and for young women to make them, to raise them in the right way, the proper way, so that they're properly adjusted and are able to be content and happy and, and successful in life. So be the kind, so when I talk about appreciate God's will for marriage, I'm talking about part of it, and more importantly about how you treat your children, how you raise your children. Work on that. I, I can tell you that every child is different. Even twins are different, aren't they? They're all different. And you have to approach each one differently. You have to have the same general rules. But the thing that's got to be driving it is you want that child to grow up to be a well-adjusted, faithful child of God. That's your goal. That's your desire. Make that your goal. So appreciate God's welfare and appreciate the gift of children that God has blessed you with. Second thing is appreciate the value of your inheritance. Like what inheritance? Well, how about this inheritance? Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. How very important, very valuable thing, inheritance that is ours. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. Let's see if I can get There we go. Verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now you see the difference between Esau, who all he can think about, yeah, I want to hold beans, I'll trade the most precious thing God has given me, or at least inherit this precious and valuable inheritance that God has given me for a bowl of beans. And he's saying, Peter said, telling here through Revelation that this inheritance waiting for us, it is beyond compare. It does not perish. It will not be destroyed. A bowl of beans, he ate it, it was gone. And he went on his way. The inheritance God has given us will last for eternity. And it will be undefiled. There will be no impurity in it. And it will not fade away. It will not grow old and decay and lose its luster. But what do we do? We get hung up on the things of this world and we focus on them and they get old and they fall apart. Um, did I tell you the story about the, uh, my wife's Honda Element? All right, so in 2004, I bought her this brand new Honda Element. She had a my kids were embarrassed by it. They called it the toaster because uh, it looks like a toaster on wheels. But anyway, it was orange and it really, and my, and my wife liked it. And she went to pick up her daughter at softball practice at uh, high school there. Pulled up beside the field, uh, beside uh, the parking lot next to the field, and a softball goes shh, bam, right into the side of the car with a dent in it. And there was a Demi when we sold it you know, in 2020. But anyway. Uh, and, you know, the car lasted for a while. Then the engine went bad. But yeah, that's the way things are. Stuff, you get too, too wrapped up in our stuff. And it gets dents and dings in it. And eventually, it quits running. And, or, or, and, and even if it doesn't quit running completely, you have to spend a lot of money trying to keep it running, don't you? So, stop. Forget about that. Appreciate the value of your eternal inheritance. Put eternity on a, on a level. Elevate it to the highest possible level in your mind. So when you're, starting, when you're thinking about things that, might, that are tempting you and you say, well, maybe I might could do that. You know, 
that might cost my, my eternity with God. Not, okay, no, no, not worth it. Not worth it. Not worth it. Not worth it. Eternity is worth everything. Invest in that and appreciate it. Recognize its value. And then the last thing is appreciate your role in receiving it. Isaac, or Esau just threw his away. He did that by choice. He didn't have to, but he did. Because he didn't appreciate it. Appreciate what you do. You, you are responsible to respond to the gospel. God's grace. Without God's grace, none of us will be saved. And uh, Bob's going to be talking about that in a few weeks. But without grace, we cannot be saved. But we have to respond to the offer of grace. We have to accept it and appreciate it and pursue it. So appreciate your role in receiving it by digging deep into the word of his grace. Well, those are the three things. Go ahead and get a song and look out. Go ahead and get a song and look out. And then with this last question. You know, when we talk about the hall of shame, well, let's talk about a different hall. We don't want to be in the hall of shame. We want to be in the face hall of fame. That's all I'm going to ask you. Will you aim for face hall of fame? That's what we're calling on you to. Right? We're only talking about the negative because we want to bring out the positive, the opportunity to pursue faith and pursue God and be registered in Faith's Hall of Fame. Be written into the Lamb's Book of Life. You can do that if you will choose it. And that's your opportunity tonight. We're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a second. And if you need encouragement of the brethren, if you need to become a Christian, if you need assistance and, and, and turning your life around, whatever it might be that you might need, they'll help you be right with God so you can be in the Faith Hall of Fame. What's your God? Always stay. And while we sing.